All right. Hey, we took the offering in the dark there today, didn't we? You doing all right with that? Okay. Remember, you put money in, not take it out, right? Okay. In the dark? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. We'll, we'll, we'll get that right. We'll get that right. So, well, welcome to First Baptist. My name is uh, Pastor Brad, senior pastor here at First Baptist. And uh, today, last message on Jonah. Uh, life of surrender. And so if you have an outline, go ahead and take that out. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to the book of Jonah or on your phone. I'm going to give kind of an overview of where we've been um, because I want to do something just a little bit different here today. Uh, I've enjoyed going through the series and um, kind of um, talking about Jonah and his life and how much Really, he is like us. I think, I think that's the reason most of us relate with Jonah, uh, because we can see so much of ourselves in him and with what he did. And so on this last week, what I'd really like to do is to put some teeth into the major themes that we have been going through and ask the question, um, what does this look like in my life? As we've talked about the running that Jonah did in chapter 1. And as we've talked about how God is still full of grace in bringing Jonah back. And then he has this discipline for Jonah that he still has to go through. And as we've seen uh, God's purposes in the world and how he wants to accomplish those through Jonah. Um, and, and so I'm not sure how maybe you would grade out in those different areas of these major themes in Jonah's life. But if honestly we were to grade Jonah and how well he did, I think we would probably have to give him an F. Yeah, is that, is that what you said? Did I hear an F? I, I agree. I agree. You might say, well, you know what, Pastor Brad, that's a little hard. He still kind of accomplished the purpose. Yeah, he did, but God wasn't after that. He wanted, he wanted really Jonah's heart. He, he wanted him to do it for the right reasons, but he wanted him not only to do the right things, but for the right reasons. And so, yeah, he got to have a little bit of a makeup exam, um, but he still really came through with an F. However, before we kind of bag on Jonah and all that he did, I, I think he's probably in good company here. So if you would, how many of you, show of hands, have ever failed at anything in your life at all? Okay, you there? All right, so, so we're there, right? All right, let me just ask this. How many of you ever failed like um, a, a class in school or failed a major exam or a major test in school? All right, yeah. You know, I was a pretty good student going through uh, high school and college. I got into seminary, um, and for the first time ever, I got an F on a major test. Now, it was not in preaching, although many of you probably think it could have been, um, but uh, it was in church history, and I seriously, I kind of just blew it off. I, I thought, oh, I got this. The, the, the uh, professor had two exams and one final paper, and so all that, those three grades kind of averaged over together would uh, make up our grade, and I just was into some other things, was, was working here at the church. I just started out, I think this was my first semester in seminary, and um, I, I opened up my box the next day after taking that test. I looked at it, a big old fat F. I went, oh my goodness. I went through and I looked. It was some uh, multiple choice. It was some essay questions and things like that. So I decided, why not go and just ask the professor for grace, right? And, uh, and, and ask, hey, you know what? Some of these things are kind of subjective. Could you reread through my essays and things that I did? Because I noticed that I was one point away from a D minus. She's like, okay, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. And so I'm, th I'm thinking, thank you. You know, uh, a D looks a little better when it's averaged out over the rest of the class. And could you just get there? And so, so I went in the next day after I give him the test. He said, come back tomorrow. I went in kind of chipper and cheery. You know, I was all full of grace, ready for that. And the guy, the professor had reread my essays, had found some further mistakes and words. Misspelled. He graded me down from an F. No joke. Took me lower. I thought, when you die, say hello to Hitler for all that kind of stuff. It's like, whoa, really? And yet, to be honest with you, um, I deserved it. 
I, I, I didn't study like I should have studied. I didn't have the right attitude approaching that class. I thought I could just kind of blow it off. And, and if you look at this, you look at Jonah and you think about him. Yeah, he failed. Yeah, he got an F because the real battle that he lost was the bad attitude that he had. It, 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 was, it was a rotten, smelly, stinky attitude that he took with him. And yes, God still got his purpose accomplished, but how much more could God have done if he would have had a great attitude coming through? And so, I mean, Jonah is like case study 101 for a bad attitude. If you have your Bibles, let me just kind of go over them very quickly of what we see coming through Jonah's chapters 1 through 4. In Jonah chapter 1, verse three, we see he starts off by running away from God. So God wants him to go this way. He ends up going that way. And then in verse 12, we see that he enters his first, just throw me into the sea. Yes, it's my fault, but I'm not going to change. I'd rather die than change. And so in, ver in chapter two is when he's thrown into the sea, he's in the belly of the whale, and he has a little bit of this attitude change. He, he, he repents, but it's really not a full repentance. It's enough that God says, okay, at least I can use you now. And in chapter 3, he does what God has called him to do, goes to the Ninevites. But we're already back in chapter 4, he's saying, God, I don't like it that you um, uh, save them. Uh, I'd rather have seen them die because of what they've done to you and to me and to my people. And in chapter 4, verse 1, it says Jonah was again angry. He's greatly displeased at God for this. In verse Verse 3, it says, it is better for me to die since this is not working the way that I wanted it to work. And in chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, we see that God, okay, provides him a little vine. Uh, but then that vine is eaten. It was giving him some shade. And this scorching wind is coming. In verse 8, it says, the scorching wind came about. And again, Jonah goes to the side of saying, just let me die. Just let me be done with this. And if that's not enough, in verse 9, God says, do you now have any right to even be angry, Jonah? Come on, Jonah. Should you even be angry? And Jonah has the gall to say, yes, I do. I'm concerned mainly about me and my comfort, and it's not being met. And what God never gets through to him on is what we see in verses 10 and 11, that God's heart really is for the Ninevites. God's heart is for those who do not know him. God's heart is for those who cannot tell spiritually the right hand from their left hand. And that's, that, that's God's true heart in the midst of that, what Jonah missed. And so let me step off there where we kind of ended the series last week. And let me just give you kind of this, this, what this major overview of Jonah's bad attitude shows. Because we can see it in our own lives and we have to look into the mirror and say, okay, am I in the midst of this? And here it is. It's your first fill in there on the outline. It says this. The greatest competition for the kingdom of God is the kingdom of me. Let me say that again. The greatest competition for the kingdom of God is the kingdom of me. It's never getting to the place of surrender. It's never getting to the place of waving the white flag and saying, all right, God, I'm done with my agendas. I'm done with what I'm wanting to do. And God, it's about you. It's raising up the white flag with what God wants. In fact, if you have your um, if flags, pull those out, raise those up. Would you just wave them with me? Yeah, place of surrender, right? Wait, hey, hey, let's try this. Let's get coordinated on this. Go to the right. Go to the left. Whoa, that looks kind of cool from up here. Go to the right, go to the left. Yeah, wave them in front of your neighbor's face now, okay? Yeah. All right, you can, you're, you're having a little bit too much fun with those now. Okay, hold on to those. We'll, we'll come back to those, okay? But it's never coming to a place of surrendering and saying, um, oh, God, it's not about me, but it's about you. And you can see how much Jonah fought this with God. I mean, he out and out defied some of God's asking of what he wanted to do. He out and out challenged God 
with what he wanted to do. And, and this was not on something that could go either way. You know how we have those things in our lives where we ask God, God, do you want me to go this way or that way? And God's a little bit like, it, it's, it's okay. It's not going to make a major life difference, you know, if you purchase this house or that house. They're both about the same price range, so it's not going to affect your budget in incredible ways, and so that should be fine. Um, God, do you want me to go to this school or to that school? Um, and definitely we might get some leanings uh, to go to one or the other, or there might be times where God's like, it's, it's okay, either one, you can glorify me in the midst of that. Um, you know, it's not like these little decisions that sometimes we have to make. God, do you want me to have a Toyota or a Honda? Or after lunch, is it burrito or is it a taco? You know, like those things, like, like we can go either way on that. These are things that God is saying, no, this is what I want you to do, Jonah. And Jonah says, no. Jonah says, that, that's not my agenda. That, that's not what I want to have happen. God says, wrong answer. Jonah challenges God. Jonah is defiant. And, and before we say, well, you know, at least we're not that bad. You know, maybe we flunk some things. Maybe we're not all the way surrendered to some things. Um, Jonah really did have a, a, a kingdom of me issue going on. And to be honest, more of us in here might have that as well in our lives than we care to admit. That it's about the kingdom of me before the kingdom of God. That it's about, God, it, it's what I want in my comfort and, and, and my control and, God, my lifestyle or, God, my way of doing things than it is, God, I'm fully surrendered. Okay, I'm yours. And, and the reason I say that is because the Bible talks about if you are a passive Christian, and I'll use the terminology that the Bible uses, if you are a lukewarm Christian, God despises it. And at least Jonah was cold. We can see that. At least he was cold. See, God hates lukewarm. God would rather have you be hot or cold. And the one thing about Jonah is that you know where he is coming from. His heart is really cold towards the things of the Lord. You say, okay, well, that's kind of rough to kind of go down that road. No, do this. Jump over to the book of Revelation in the back. The back of your Bible, you have um, John's vision of the end times. And in Revelation chapter 3, we see these words that Jesus is saying. And he's talking about these different churches. And he's labeling them, and he's identifying them. And these words that Jesus speaks of one church in uh, Revelation chapter 3 is to a church called Laodicea. And it's a lot like the American church, where it's well-to-do, and they don't think they need God. And so Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, in fact, it's up on the screen. Would you read it together? Let's read it off the screen so we're all reading together. Go. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. He's saying here, you know, your spirit's not good. Your, your concerns are not my concerns. You're not dependent upon me and what I want to do in the midst of your church, Laodicea. You're not there. You think you're there, but you're not. In fact, the reason I know how this kind of works out is you go two verses up, and let me read it to you. It's in Revelation 3, 15 and 16, where it says, I know your deeds, that you are neither, what, the words, what are the words? Hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are, what's the word there? What? Lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Ouch. Yeah, that, that's an ouch verse going on there, right? You say, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to be lukewarm? Pastor Barry, break that down. Give us the Greek on lukewarm. Okay, let me, let me show you what lukewarm is. Let me relate it to you today. Let's say after the service, you come to our cafe or you go to one of these coffee houses that you enjoy and you buy your frappe, latte, macchiato, taza, whatever you are into, right? And you order it piping hot 
or you go on the other side and you do one of those chilled, you know, iced mochas type of things, and they slide it across the counter to you, call out your name very proudly, you walk up, you pick it up, you begin to drink it, and you discover that it's been out for like 24 hours, and it's neither hot nor cold, it is room temperature, and as soon as that liquid touches your lips, what do you do with it? Yeah, you spit that puppy out, don't you? You don't start just like, mm, that's good, start guzzling it down. Absolutely not. I mean, it's just like, it's almost like a reflex. Like, it is done. It is gone. You would not take that into your body. You want to you wanna be done with it and spit it out. Th that's, that's what this word looks like here. This, this, this word lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. We don't have to analyze it at all. You know, like lukewarm, lukewarm simply means get it out, spit it out. He does not want to have anything to do with it. It's simply, um, um, uh, it's not too complicated. And so Jonah is into this kingdom of me because he was not hot or cold. He was, he was really a lukewarm kind of person. He was, well, no, let's be honest about it. He was more cold than hot. And so being that way, he had never raised the flag. He never, and you know, some guys came up to me after the last service and said, I have flag envy. You get the big one. I got the little, little, little flags. I said, you know what? More to surrender, right? That's what it is. We got to surrender. We come to the place of saying, God, I don't want to be lukewarm. I don't want to be cold be hot for you. I want to know what you want for me, and I want to take those steps in my life. And I don't want to be one of those people who says, God, I, I want it my way. I want to do the things that I want in my timing. Jonah was in the kingdom, into the kingdom of me, and that is the greatest competition for the kingdom of God. And as Americans, let me be honest, we, we have this one down. Because there's a lot of things we can do in life that God blesses us with, but then we kind of say, okay, God, now I've got this. I was talking with a gentleman who runs an orphanage in Kenya uh, not long ago, and he, we were talking about this mentality, this, this lifestyle that Americans have over the Kenyans and how the ministry that he has there and the orphanage, and, and he says, I don't have an option to rely upon reserves. I don't have an option uh, to do anything but rely upon God. We, we, we can't be lukewarm. We can't just say, God, I got this. I'll take care of this. We have to be fully dependent upon Him. And so I thought about, okay, how can I help our church see lukewarm and what it means? And I remember the book, uh, Crazy Love by Francis Chan. And in that book, he has a number of descriptions of what lukewarm people are like. And so if you have your outline, let me just go through these. We'll go through them very quickly, but let, let's talk about this. The first fill in there under a characteristics of lukewarm people is that lukewarm people do not live by faith. Their lives are structured so they never have to. What do I mean by that? We have our savings. We, we, we have our retirement plan. Our refrigerators are full. We mainly have good health. And so we don't have to trust God for any of those types of things. In fact, the statement in the book that he made that was really the step on your toes is that honestly, lukewarm people in this category, their lives don't look much different than if they suddenly stopped believing in God. That's how lukewarm they are. Secondly, lukewarm people love others, but they do not seek to love others as much as they love themselves. They, they love the lovable people, and there's a lot of lovable people here at First Baptist. There's a lot of lovable people that you have in your life. It's easy to love the lovable people, but maybe we don't love the people who can't or won't love us back Maybe even we love people with some strings attached because it makes us feel good or what we can gain from their relationship. Lukewarm people, next fill in, gauge their morality or their goodness by comparing themselves to the secular world. 
they feel satisfied that at least they're not, even though they're not hardcore for Jesus, that they're nowhere as horrible as maybe the guy down the street. Or maybe they're not like Jonah, Jonah out and out defiant to God, running the other way. At least I'm in church. I'm, I'm not, you know, like um, bad compared to the people I hear about on the news. Next one down, lukewarm people. Give money to charity and to the church as long as it doesn't impinge on their standard of living. Jesus talks about that in Luke chapter 21 where he sees some of the rich people, the Pharisees, giving big offerings at the church and they did it in a proud way. And then he sees this little widow come and give just a couple of mites and he says, oh, take a look at what she just did. She gave out of her heart. She, she, she didn't give out of the excess that she had. She gave all that she even had. I remember a number of months ago where a, a family came to me. They're a young family. And they said, Pastor Brad, is there a place that we can give to serve with directly with the needy uh, here in the community? And as we talked a little bit more, they said, you know, we, we tied the First Baptist. We're blessed to be able to do that. We, we even give over and above to missions work. Um, but we just want our kids to see us directly helping with the needy as well. And I thought, there's a family who gets it. That yes, they're sacrificing out of their, they could use that fund, those monies for so many other things, but they want to give and continue to give because they don't want to be lukewarm. And I was reminded of that sentence, that statement, that's not about equal gifts, it's about equal sacrifices that we give. Remember a gal who was coming to our crosswalk service a number of years ago, she was in college. And um, she would give just a couple of dollars every Sunday. She told me about the story. She'd give just a couple of dollars every Sunday. It was all that she could give because when she was going through college, she had loans, she had financial, financial aid, she didn't have a job, but she wanted that practice in her life to be a giving life. She wanted to start to demonstrate that. She wanted to give that to God and saying, God, I don't have a lot right now, but I want to start even in my younger years. Today, those few dollars have grown into thousands of dollars. And it's still easy for her to give because she started out with little and said, God, it's not about equal gifts. It's about equal sacrifice, and I want to continue to give and sacrifice as I have before. Lukewarm people, though, don't make that connection. They just give when perhaps they feel like they can give. Lukewarm people, next fill in there. Lukewarm people rarely share their faith with their neighbors, their co-workers, or their friends. They're afraid that they'll be rejected. They're afraid that it'll be uncomfortable. They're afraid that they'll be labeled the Jesus freak or the odd one in the office or around the neighborhood or in the family. And so they back off and they don't share. Next fill in, lukewarm people don't really want to be saved from their sin. They only want to be saved from the penalty of their sin. They don't generally hate sin and aren't truly sorry for it. They're just merely sorry because God is going to punish them. And they want to get through that. And it becomes not about what John says in John or Jesus says in John 10 10 that Jesus came to give life and to give it to its full, to give it in abundance. And so we just kind of kind of just skimp by by God, just forgive me for that, but I really don't hate doing it, and I'll probably end up doing it again. Lukewarm people love God, but they do not love Him with all their heart, soul, and strength. Matthew chapter 22, Jesus talks about that. That's the first, that's the greatest commandment, to love God in that way. Lukewarm people are moved by stories about people who do radical things for Christ, yet they don't act themselves. They hear, they're inspired, but it doesn't cause them to take a step. Last week, I asked a question that was a little haunting for some of you. I asked the question, if every Christian was like you, would the local church have an impact in the world? Think about that for just a moment. If every Christian served like you serve or don't serve, if every Christian prayed like you prayed or don't pray, if every per Christian gave like you gave or don't give, if every Christian witnessed like you witness or don't witness, wh wh wherever you came down on that, if every other Christian in the world was like you, 
Would the church have an impact or would it be retreating? I think it's a fair question to ask of if you're lukewarm or not. Because if you look at that and you say, man, no, we wouldn't be doing a whole lot because I don't do a whole lot, then great. Use that as some sort of motivation to say, God, don't let me have the sin of Jonah. God, don't let me stay lukewarm. Allow me to be hot for you. Because impact in the world, really locally, impact in the city of Stockton, happens when we are a church that is not lukewarm, but has more people who are hot than cold and not in the middle. In fact, I would pray that God would never want to spit First Baptist Stockton out of its mouth, out of his mouth. That we would not be the church like Laodicea. And fo- folks, i got to be honest with you. I, I think we are a hot church. Are we as hot as we can be? Absolutely not. But we're not a lukewarm church. How do I know that? Because of what you all have done in here. If you'll pull this out for just a moment. Let me go over that with you. This is really your story. This is what God was able to accomplish through you. If you are someone who has given, if you're someone who has worshipped here, if you're someone who has served, you can say, yes, I was a part of what God did. This is called our uh, annual report from 2018, and then we'll look to 2019 here in just a bit. We labeled it Heart for the City. Now, we as a church want to have a heart for the city of Stockton. If you look at a map, First Baptist Stockton is right in the center of the city of Stockton. And so I like to say, in the, in the heart of the city, with a heart for the city. You turn to the first pages, you can see a letter from myself. I'm your senior pastor. I, I'm just your senior pastor. I'm just the leader who goes to kind of lead the charge. But we all do this together. There's Tim Bryan. He's the leader of our, of our diaconate board. Leads a great group of deacons who are so servant-minded, helping us with the decisions we make across here. I hope that you'll read that on your own. Go to the next page. You can see where it talks about the attendance we have here at First Baptist. Every Sunday we have about 1,300 people who are on the grounds. And we look at that, we celebrate that. It doesn't include all the ones who are here on Tuesday nights and Thursday nights celebrate recovery and Wednesdays and others come in. So we have many more than that who come throughout the week. But you look at what is here on Sunday morning, folks, we could double. And we don't do that to say, hey, look at us, we're growing in big numbers and such. We do that to say we have the room, we have moved over to this facility. We can double our attendance on Sunday mornings. We can double the impact for Jesus Look at what's going on with the First Baptist kids. You see the different ministries that are taking place, Wednesday nights, Awanas and such. Look down there about halfway down, Salvation Decisions. Thrilled with that, that 185 children actually prayed to receive Christ in 2018. Vacation Bible School, Easter, whatever it may be. Yeah, that is a definite praise. To say, God, you're doing something in the midst of children's hearts. You look at the student ministries. have 87 kids who are here on a regular basis. Sunday mornings, that is. That matches Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings when they do their programs. Look at First Baptist Christian Schools. In fact, that we reach 152 families in this community. Not all of them attend First Baptist. In fact, some of them in the preschool are not even believers yet. But we have a preschool so we can reach out to them and pray that they will start to come into the school and even into our church. You look over to the right-hand side and the no, grow, serve, and share. 88 baptisms, people going under the water, surrendering and saying, God, I'm yours, coming back up and living in that celebration. Love the fact that we're able to baptize 88 people, but we know there are many more out there. In fact, if you're ready to, to be baptized right after the service, go into the large meeting room right through those doors. Pastor Derek will meet with you on the fast track class that will help you understand what you need to do to be baptized up here in a couple of weeks. You look at the community groups that we had when we talked about Grace is Greater, um, a number of those 60 different groups all over the city of Stockton, over 500 people serving on a regular basis. Thank you, thank you, thank you for serving in that way. Uh, Sharing your faith, the love boxes, carrying Christmas tree. Go to the next page if you would. You see a map. Able to go across the world and give special offerings as we put those out before you. You see the different mission trips that we've taken, six different ones, 140. 
43 people on the mission field, number of different agencies, our breakfast club, able to serve anywhere on a given Saturday from 450 uh, people to over 700 people um, every Saturday. That's what they go out there and serve. On Saturday mornings they come and they gather, they prepare a meal, and then take it to the homeless and truly meeting those needs. They do a wonderful job. You think about the missions offering that you see there, over $200,000 given to the Lord's work just through missions. Not all of that is even included in the total giving of just under $2 million. You look at that and you say, thank you, God for allowing us to give, to see your work go forward. And on top of that, this is how I know, First Baptist, that we're not a lukewarm church, because right underneath that, where it says 2020 vision, so many of you, after you have given of your offerings, say, let us continue to give, as the, even the Corinthian church talks about. Let us continue to give so that generations behind will continue to know the name of Jesus. And so we have a debt on this building and on the children's building. You can see, though, it's been going down and down, lower and lower, because so many of you have said, let us give over and above. And I just have to say, thank you, thank you, Thank you for what you are doing to build a legacy in the city of Stockton. It does not just happen. It happens because people like yourself sacrifice and give. And if not all of you are there yet, I pray and trust that you would also want to join us in giving over and above to making a difference. Go to the next page. You can see the Sunday message series that we have had in 2018. If you've been here throughout the year, you'll recognize some of those. You can look at those on your own again. You see on the top of the page uh, on the right-hand side of that where God has increased our territory, not only at 3535 North El Dorado, but at 33 West Alpine and the building that we are in right now. Go to the next page if you would, because now here's where we get into 2019. And we've already been doing some of this stuff, but I just want to bring it up and put it before you. We look forward. We have 10 core values that we operate by. They're biblical values out of God's Word. And you see nine of them on the left-hand page. You see the 10th over on the right-hand page where it says evangelism. That's how we want to put our vision to practice. And so you see everything from the biblical authority, um, over 120 people going through the Bible in 90 days and really just reading God's Word, seeing how it applies to their lives, to the time of worship where we uh, multiple uh, or multi-generation worship, not only here but on our campus at 8 o'clock, um, uh, fellowship opportunities. Do you realize this, that this last year we were able to add on um, Ray Martin onto our team, not only with the Upward uh, Sports Ministry, but also in a, a ministry called Adventure Sports. That's, he's helping us do things like the basketball and the football and the go-karts and things like that where we can invite others to come alongside and rub shoulders with them. And he's been extended the opportunity to be a chaplain for the Stockton Ports this upcoming year. And he said, yes, I would love to do that. Uh, actually, they asked for he and his wife to minister to the ball players as well as their wives. And so we're just continuing to want to grow in that way. You see, Growth Track, an opportunity that if you're not a member yet here, at First Baptist Church, that's a great way to understand what we believe and what we know. And going through that four-week class right after the service will start that process of membership for you. I don't have time to go through all these different ministries, but let me highlight the prayer ministry. Uh, we're going to be doing a prayer walk in just a couple of weeks on February 24th. And so today out at the um, uh, information booth, or there's a table out there, you can sign up for where you would like to go on that Sunday afternoon. Four o'clock, we'll gather in different points around the city of Stockton, and we'll pray for the city of Stockton. We'll walk through those areas, and we'll pray for them. So please, be a part of that and sign up even today. There's there's a parenting class going on right now next door for those of you who want to change your generational and how maybe you've been raising your families or your grandkids and, and understand how can I do this in more of a biblical way. Our singles ministry has under all people a divorce care, a 13-week program that they're revamping and saying we want to help people who are going through that tough, tough stage of life when you walk through a divorce. Celebrate Recovery Ministry, Sal Azevedo is revamping that as well so we can reach the city of Stockton. We want to have a greater social media impact here in the city of Stockton. And then, of course, on the last page there, you can see the plans for evangelism and how we want to continue to reach out to the city. A heart for the city. 
I pray you might read through this. Pray through this. Pray for that vision. Because that vision will never come about. Understand this, folks. That vision will never come about from a church that is lukewarm. It will only come about from a church that says we want to serve more. We want to love more. We want to worship God more. We want to give more. We want to give of our lives more. Next, fill in under lukewarm people. Lukewarm people surrender some of their lives, maybe even most of their lives, but not all. The only way First Baptist will continue to reach the city of Stockton is if we have more people step up and say, God, God, you got me. You got everything about me. Not just little bits, all of it. I came across a haunting verse this week. You see it at the bottom of the um, outline. It's a verse that talks about um, losing your saltiness. You remember last week I said the phrase or the saying, Christians are a lot like manure. Spread them out, and they help things grow, pile them up, and they all stink, right? If we stay together like that. Look at this haunting verse that comes out of Luke chapter 14. It says this. Luke chapter 14. Salt is good, says Jesus, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? And you understand, you say, okay, God, that, 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 that's some lukewarm qualities there. Those are some qualities that are not in place um, to see you do some work. Uh, look at the next verse, though. Verse 35 goes on to say, It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It's thrown out. I looked at that and I thought, God, that is haunting that how would you like to die and hear from the Son of God, you even ruined manure. Not fun. Ouch. Lukewarm. You lost your saltiness. Now, before we have to feel too heavy upon this, I know from time to time we all demonstrate the lukewarm qualities. We all demonstrate some of those lukewarm characteristics. But here's the question I want to ask you, and I know I've skipped over some things, guys, so we can go back. Here's the question, the bottom of the page, in the box. Is my life characterized by those kind of lukewarm traits? That's the most important question to ask here. Because, yes, seasons of life come. Yes, there might be times when we feel kind of lukewarm, but is that what your life is characterized by? And if you say yes, okay, what are you going to do about it? See, the ones I'm concerned about are not the ones who say yes and then do something about it. It's those of you who say yes, and you feel maybe a little conviction here in the services, but you don't do anything about it. You don't leave here and say, let me go and be a part of the prayer walks. You don't say, let me go and be a part of a class that will help me grow in my faith. You don't say, let me give to the ministry here at First Baptist so we can affect the world and the people around us. You say, no, let, I, I'm not going to jump in and serve, and I'm, I'm not going to read my Bible. I'm not going to take more time to hear it because it impinges upon my lifestyle. That's not where I want to go. That would be someone who's lukewarm. And if that's you, please hear that warning today. God wants to use you in a great way. And the only way that we're going to continue to reach the heart of the city, that God wanted Jonah to reach, that God wants us to reach as well, is for more of us to come on board. It's for more of us to say, God, we surrender. We surrender in fact, would you take out your flags again? This time, don't hold them up. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to put it just on your lap. Maybe you have a Bible there or you have the outline there. Just, just put it right on it. Kind of put it out in front of you so that you see the full flag in front of you. 
maybe like, like a page. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at that white blank flag, reminiscent of a page, and I want you to picture on there be it a word, be it an image, whatever it may be, I want you to picture on there what's keeping you lukewarm. What's keeping you from being hot for Christ? Maybe it's your comfort. M maybe, maybe it's your critical spirit. Maybe it's your tongue. Maybe it's your secret sin that nobody else in here knows about but you and God do. Maybe it's holding back your finances from him. Maybe it's your negative attitude. Maybe it's your inability to step up and say, God, I know you want me to do something for your kingdom, but I'm just not ready to do it like Jonah. What is it? And today when you go home, maybe you could take that flag with a permanent marker or a pen or whatever it may be, either draw what that picture came to your mind or write out the words that you need to put on there and then put this flag somewhere that will remind you. Have I surrendered that? God, do you have it all? Have you surrendered everything to God? Maybe today it's even that you haven't given your life to Christ yet. That's the first step. Maybe today it's you haven't been baptized, and so you want to take that step. I don't know what it is, but in your life, on that flag, whatever that represents, write it down, picture it on there, and today when we sing our last song, Pastor Daniel is going to kind of lead us in this. I pray you will be able to wave that flag. You'll be able to lift that flag high and say, God, I surrender it to you today. Jonah's life was an interesting one. God still accomplishes purpose. But you think about how much more God wanted to do and how much more he could have done if he'd have been all surrendered. I pray, church, we're there. Will you pray with me? God, sometimes we need some spiritual conviction. Sometimes we need just to be reminded how much you want to do in us. And so, Lord, as we've come to a place of understanding more about Jonah and his life, we hold up a mirror and see how much it reflects ourselves. God, would you forgive us? God, would you forgive us for having the sin of Jonah? God, would you forgive us for the lack of faith? God, would you forgive us for desiring comfort above you? God, would you forgive us for lack of obedience? Would you forgive us for a critical spirit at times for words that hurt instead of build up God we, we, we surrender that to you today folks maybe you're here today and you say you know what pastor I, I'm working on that I know I have some things in my life that I need to surrender would you pray for me and would you do this if you'd just like us as a staff to pray specifically for me to pray for you would you just take your flag and would you just lift it up out? Every head bow, every eye closed. Would you just lift your flag up and say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Praise God. Praise God. Hundreds across this auditorium. Praise God. We're there. Let me pray for you just a bit. Let me also say this. Maybe today you're saying, Pastor, I have not yet surrendered my life to Jesus. I've not taken that step of saying yes to him. And today would be the day to say, Lord Jesus, today I fully surrender to you. Today I ask for Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. I believe what he did for me on the cross, that he died for my sins. He rose from the grave. And today, Lord Jesus, today is the day where I mark it down that I'm surrendering my life by saying yes to you. And you know, if you just prayed that prayer right now, would you just raise your white flag to me so that I may see you? Praise God. Praise God, I see dozens across here. Praise God, today's the day. You mark it down, you've taken that step. 
Praise Jesus. I want to remind you as well, if you've not been baptized, today's a day to surrender it as well. God, thank you for this time of surrender. Thank you for these times of decisions that we can make that will impact our lives to come. Lord, we lift our white flags. We lift our lives up to you. And even now as we sing this last worship song, Lord Jesus, may be lifted high so that you may use us in great ways. We love you and we thank you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray and surrender. Amen and amen.